Our next speaker, Brother Jerry Brewer, was born <laughs> June 7th, 1940. I didn't stop talking. What is it? June 7th, 1941 in Childress, Texas. And he's got of Celtic ancestors. And uh, I think that's interesting. Uh, Brother Kendrick is led in prayers of Hebrew ancestors. So if that makes any difference. I don't know. <laughs> At least some of them. The rest of them, I think, were Texas outlaws. Uh, began preaching at age 16. He's done local work in Dill City, Oklahoma, El Reno, Oklahoma, Chillicothe, Texas, and Elk City, Oklahoma. He's preached in numerous lectureships, including this one, conducting meetings in Oklahoma, Texas, and Arkansas, Montana, Kansas, and Georgia. He's done extensive preaching in Kenya and teaching in the Kalamindi School of Preaching. He's married to the former Shirlene Holly. They have six children, 17 grandchildren, and three and uh, three and soon to be four great-grandchildren. Currently preaches for the Northeast Church of Christ in Elk City, Oklahoma. We appreciate him very much for his love for the truth, his stand for the truth, and we look forward to hearing him speak on this subject, the fatal error that the Holy Spirit is the same person as Jesus. Come speak to us, Brother Brewer. He's, he's cranky. If he keeps on, I'm going to cut him what he's got. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm gonna come. Go ahead. Speak, and I'll start you. Okay. I suspect that uh, a lot of the uh, problems with those who, who pray to Jesus <clears throat> comes from the idea that, well, they just have no idea what the Godhead is. Uh, I, I hear people say, Lord Jesus, just help us, and Father Jesus, and, and, and so on and so forth, and they have, they have no idea what they're talking about. We're going to address this morning the idea that the fatal error, that the Holy Spirit is the same person as Jesus Christ. Actually, those who believe this, and those oneness Pentecostals, uh, this is the, this is the uh, basis of their of their whole whole doctrines uh, those who those who embrace that are uh, they're in bed with Muslims Muslims say the same thing uh, oneness doctrine the error that uh, the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ is the same person <clears throat> is the hallmark of that oneness Pentecostal church and that ascribes to deity an identity crisis. It sets forth a confused God. It makes God confused. He doesn't know who he is. Is he the Father? Is he the Son? Is he the Holy Spirit? That's what one this Pentecostal doctrine is, and that's known as modal monarchianism. Those are high sounding terms I got off the internet. You can get a lot of really, you make yourself sound really intelligent by writing things from the internet. <clears throat> or uh, uh, what is known as uh, Sibelianism, named for a man named Sibelius, who became the leader of those who believed that doctrine in the second century. See, so there's nothing new. Solomon said it. There is no new thing under the sun. <clears throat> this doctrine denies that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three separate individuals, and uh, this oneness Pentecostal bunch. Uh, and the Jesus only uh, evangelicals are actually simply modalists or modern day Sibelians. That doctrine infers that God is, uh, I guess you could say, he's got a split personality. He sometimes appears as the Father, sometimes as the Son, other times as the Holy Spirit, but in reality they say he's only Jesus. But he, he appears uh, in other ways. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Solomon said there's no new thing under the sun, so this is this is really not a not a new doctrine. But what this doctrine does, I believe that it blasphemes the name of the eternal God as some sort of 
superhero, <clears throat> like uh, Superman or, or Spider-Man, who has three secret identities, more secret identities than, than uh, any of our modern so-called superheroes. It holds the same view of God as Islam. It claims that a belief in three persons <clears throat> of the Godhead is polytheism. That is, that Jesus Christ, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, are the same persons, and that is a fatal doctrine. Now, saying that it's polytheism, that's not uh, saying that they are the same person. They accuse us of being polytheists. Sure, the scripture says there is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Deuteronomy 6.4. <clears throat> James said in James 2.19 Thou believest there is one God Thou doest well The devils also believe and tremble So the, the scriptures clearly teach there is one God Yet this divine being This one God exists in three different persons The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit the triune Godhead. Adam Clark wrote this in his comments on Genesis 1.1. Where it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The word God there is Elohim. And Clark says this, quote, The original word Elohim, God, is certainly the plural form of Elo or El or Eloah and has long been supposed by the most eminently learned and pious men to imply a plurality of persons in the divine nature. As this plurality appears in so many parts of the sacred writings to be confined to three persons, hence the doctrine of the Trinity. Now the word Trinity is not in the Bible. <clears throat> but the principle is there, the, the concept is there. There are three persons in one God. There is only one God. We are monotheists. We are not polytheists. We do not believe in many gods. There is one God. And this is, I have often told my brethren, this is, as, in, as I preached on those type of things, this is difficult for us to understand. Is the Godhead is difficult. Suffice it to say there are three in one. There is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Those three are God. The Godhead. They all partake of the divine nature. And so the word Godhead, however, is in the Bible and it appears there three times. In Acts 17, 29, Paul told the Athenians uh, uh, that we ought not to think that the Godhead is made like in the silver and gold. And then uh, it is repeated in Romans chapter 1 and uh, verse 20. In Romans 1, 20, he says, the Godhead, or speaking of the Godhead, he says that... Uh, uh, the invisible things of man or of him are seen from the creation of the world uh, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead and then over in uh, the book of Colossians he says he says the same thing uh, he, re he refers to the Godhead in Colossians 2 9 and in each place that means deity each of these three divine persons composing the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, possess the divine nature. They are not three gods, but three co-equal divine personalities. There is only one divine nature, one God, but three persons possess this divine nature. Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are not the same person. Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are God, not gods, but God, 
but they're not the same person. Consider the following. God is one. Only one divine essence exists. And then the name for that divine essence or nature is God. Only one exists. For a person to assert that one divine essence exists is equal to saying only one God exists. And that's what we say. And that's what the Bible teaches. There is only one God. There are not two or three or three hundred divine natures. There's not, there's not more than one God. There is one. And yet, God is three. The oneness of the divine substance correctly describes God as it pertains to the divine nature, the divine essence. But in another sense, God exists as three persons. Three as it pertains to the three persons who share this one divine substance. Thus, there exists no logical contradiction to say that there is one God, but this God exists in three. To say that God is one and God is three. He exists as one in one sense and as three in another sense, the three persons are, of course, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And those three are God. That's God. That's one God. The Old Testament conveys this idea. In fact, that's what, uh, uh, that's what Adam Clark was talking about a few moments ago we looked at. The Old Testament conveys the idea, and it does so implicitly. It doesn't didn't come out and say there were three in the Godhead and, and in the beginning they all worked and did this but they, it is implied there by the plural Elohim which indicates more than one not more than one divine essence but more than one person partaking of the divine essence God spoke in the beginning God spoke the worlds into existence the Word, Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's what John 1, 1 says. In the beginning was the Word. Now later on in the book of uh, in 1 John, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's talking about Jesus Christ. The Word is Christ. In the beginning was the Word. God spoke. He upholds all things by the power of his work, uh, by the power of his word. And we are told that Christ uh, uh, was the uh, Christ made all by him was all, were all things made that was made. Without him was not anything made. So you have the word, Christ. The father, the great architect speaking. The word, Christ, active in the creation. And in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. Now later on, uh, I don't think I included it in the book, <clears throat> but later on in his commentary, uh, uh, Adam Clark had another uh, very interesting comment about the Holy Spirit, about the word moved. It said it was as though a, a hen brooding over her, her nest to bring forth life. That's what the Holy Spirit did. The Holy Spirit infused life. The Holy Spirit gave life. The Holy Spirit put life in the seed. And that law of biogenesis that God set forth in the beginning, that everything brings forth after its own kind, he said, let there be, let everything have seed in itself and bring forth after its own kind. And the Holy Spirit put that power in there. Just like he put power in the Word of God which is the seed of the kingdom, which brings forth after its kind. You cannot preach the word of God and have it produce 
a member of a denomination. It won't do it. The Word of God, unadorned with any of the ideas and thoughts and, and uh, comments and tricks of men, the Word of God pure in its simplicity. It's too simplistic, I guess. But in its simplicity, the Word of God will bring forth a Christian because that's the way the Holy Spirit intended. That's the life he put in it. That's the life he put in it. The Godhead can be illustrated this way. God is one, singular. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are plural. They're three, but there aren't three gods. They're three persons. One God in three persons, and each of these persons fully partakes of the divine essence, the divine being. God is the great architect of the scheme of redemption. All the members of the Godhead, besides the, the physical creation, all the members of the Godhead also acted in concert in the unfolding of the great scheme of redemption for mankind. God is the, or the Father is the architect of it. God the Son procured our salvation by his death on the cross. He purchased our death. He purchased us from our sins with his own blood. And the Holy Spirit revealed that salvation. He revealed it in concert with that eternal purpose. Jesus Christ the Son is called the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13 God the Holy Spirit is the great revelator of that. It was he who was promised to the apostles as a comforter to replace Jesus who returned to the Father. I want you to follow along with me to look at John 14, verses 16 and 17. John 14, 26, and John 16, 12 through 15. We're going to read those. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. For he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he shall guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I, he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. Now that's the reading from John 14, 16 and 17, John 14, 26, John 16, 13, or 12 through 15. Now, having read that and looked at that, <clears throat> think about this. The doctrine that Jesus Christ is the same person as God the Father and the Holy Spirit is nothing short of ridiculous. I mean, it's inane when you consider these passages we've just read. Now think about this. If the oneness doctrine is true, if Jesus is the same person as the Father and as the Holy Spirit, then here's how that, the, that this, these passages would read that we just finished. And I will pray myself and I shall give you another comforter that I may abide with you forever, even myself, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth me not, neither knoweth me, for I dwelleth with you and shall be in you. But the comforter, which is me, whom I will send in my name, I shall teach you all things and shall bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them. Now, how be it, or when I, the Spirit of truth, am come, I will guide you into all truth, for I shall not speak of myself, but whatsoever I shall hear, that shall I speak, and I will show you things to come. I shall glorify me, for I will receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that I have are mine. Therefore I said, I shall take of mine, shall show it unto you. Isn't that ridiculous? 
if Christ and the Holy Spirit are the same person, that's how it would have read. I'll pray myself. I'll tell myself this. I'll talk to myself. I'll go around muttering to myself. They, oneness Pentecostalism makes God a blathering idiot. Reduces the Son of God to a babbling idiot who talks to himself. Who prays to himself. Who uh, assumes different personas and is confused about his own identity. What was that movie, the Three Faces of Eve or something many years ago? This woman had some kind of personality problems, thought she was different people or something. That's exactly what, that's exactly what oneness Pentecostalism does with the Godhead and with our blessed Savior Jesus Christ. Makes the Godhead some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, entity with an identity crisis our knowledge of the three persons in the Godhead as it is revealed in the Bible is a matter actually of progressive revelation now when we use that term we mean that God didn't reveal himself as three persons in the beginning of his revelation but he did it progressively over a period of time uh, so that uh, so that it could be fully understood. For example, the doctrine of the Trinity, as we noted from Genesis 1, is implicitly taught in the Old Testament. It is not explicitly made known, however, in the Scriptures until we come to the New Testament. But the doctrine in the New Testament bursts forth in full bloom. Now, I wonder why God chose to do it that way. Well, I don't know. But once we come to the New Testament and see how God exists in three persons, we can look back into the Old Testament and see the indication there that, yes, there was a plurality in the Godhead. There is. This knowledge of the Trinity from the Old Testament, though, is made clear only in the light of the New which goes along with what we've always said. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. It's the same thing. Progressive revelation. Now, I want us to look at uh, some scriptures here. Uh, that, uh, for instance, this one illustrating the, uh, the triune God. That was done at, that, that was illustrated at the baptism of Jesus. And here's another one of those things that's just really too simplistic for holy roller <laughs> uh, uh, apologists. Three persons are vividly, three persons in the Godhead, vividly illustrated at the baptism of Jesus. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. Very simple. And, when Je and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now you see that picture that Matthew paints there? And Jesus... When he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. Who? Jesus Christ. Where was he? He was in the water. He's baptized in the River Jordan. He comes up. Says he come up straightway. Straightway immediately. When he came up, what? The heavens were open. Well, what happened then? Well, the Spirit, like a dove, descended upon him. Who? Upon Jesus. Who did? The Spirit of God. Descended where? Upon Jesus. And a voice from heaven 
saying, this is my beloved son. Now there you have the three members of the Godhead. The three divine members of the one God. They're there for us to see Christ on earth. Coming up out of the water. Jesus. The one the Pentecostals say is the Holy Spirit. But not so. The Holy Spirit is descending upon him. He's not descending upon himself. This is Jesus. This is the Holy Spirit descending. Well, where's the Father? He's in heaven. You hear him? This is my beloved Son. This voice from heaven. This voice comes from heaven. Christ on earth. The Holy Spirit between heaven and earth. The Father in heaven. See how simple that is? Of course that's too simplistic for those who want things to be who want things to be a little difficult. Our knowledge of the three persons in the Godhead is a matter of divine revelation. <clears throat> in other words, we know what we know because God has chosen to reveal that to us. We wouldn't know there were three persons in the Godhead if it wasn't for the Bible. We wouldn't know that. <clears throat> it's not something anyone can learn from studying astronomy. If you're going to take a telescope and study the universe, uh, you can do that, but you can't come to the conclusion that God is three persons in one. You may gain a lot of knowledge, but you won't gain that knowledge through studying astronomy. No experiments in a, in a science lab, no, no uh, logical argument in the form of a a syllogism, no mathematical question or uh, anything, equation, or any other way that we can gain natural knowledge will inform us that there are three persons who compose the Godhead. Jesus Christ is not the Father. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not Jesus Christ. The Father is not Jesus. Jesus is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. Three divine persons in one God. The fatality of that doctrine, the error that the Holy Spirit's the same person as God was debated uh, by Brother G.K. Wallace and a Pentecostal preacher in 1951, a Pentecostal preacher named Ray Vaughn. And uh, that debate uh, back in 1999 was reviewed by Tom Waycaster in this, this uh, or the Houston College of the Bible lectureship. <clears throat> I want to read you what he wrote. By the very definition of father and son taken from the ordinary dictionary, Brother Wallace pointed out that it is linguistically impossible for someone to be his own father and or son. But if the modal concept, that's what we talked about at first, this modal monarchianism, that God reveals himself in three modes rather than being three different persons. If the modal concept of the Godhead is correct, then Jesus was in fact his own son and his own father at the same time. Since that is impossible, then one must conclude that Jesus is not the son of God. The very foundation of the oneness, holiness doctrine on the Godhead lies in this misconception of that oneness. The phrase one God does not necessarily mean that there is only one person, something which Mr. Vaughn and those of his persuasion have missed. Now, if Vaughn's oneness position is true, then the Ethiopian eunuch confessed a lie when he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If the oneness doctrine is true, what did it mean when, when he said that we must confess him before men? Matthew 10, 32. Denying that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then oneness, holiness, oneness doctrine, that error eliminates... <coughs> any confession of the sonship of Jesus Christ. It eliminates the, 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 our, our confession that we are to make, that Jesus required us to make. The fatal error that the Holy Spirit is the same person as Jesus denies 
that Jesus Christ died for our sins. They argue deity forsook the fleshly body of man when Jesus died in Matthew 27, 46. And that it was a mere man who died at Golgotha. Notice now. And this is from Marion Fox. Marion said the one who was uh, uh, the one who was resurrected was made a high priest. Hebrews 5, 5 and 6. The high priest sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. The high priest is called the Son, Hebrews 5, 5 through 7, but the Son is called God, Hebrews 1, 5 through 7. Hence, it is clear that the one who was resurrected was deity and was still called the Son. Therefore, the argument that the Son was the human spirit in the body of Jesus and the divine spirit left the body earlier is false. Since death is nothing more than a separation of the body and spirit, it follows that when the eternal spirit of the second person that God had left the fleshly body, the body died. John 19, 30 through 33. This is a revival of one of the Gnostic errors. That's what Pentecost, uh, uh, oneness Pentecostalism is. A revival of one of the Gnostic errors that the mere man, Jesus, died, but the eternal spirit did not die. Well, if Jesus was a mere man, when he died at Golgotha. And that's what they say. The Gnostics say uh, the same thing, uh, which is not much different than what the Muslims say, that, that he didn't really die there. He, he fainted or whatever. But this idea that mere man died at Golgotha and not the Son of God denies the death of Jesus for our sins, it denies the efficacy of his blood for the salvation of our souls. <clears throat> but the Son of God said in Matthew 26, 28, this is my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. That deity did not inhabit the fleshly body of Jesus when he died also was the contention of the Pentecostal preacher Marvin A. Hicks who debated Brother Guy Woods at Kennett, Missouri on this topic in, uh, or on some topics in 1975. They debated the topics of the Godhead, Holy Spirit, baptism, and miracles. This debate was also reviewed in the 1999 Houston College of the Bible Lectureship. Brother Woods asked him, he asked Hicks, to whom Jesus spoke when he uttered on Calvary, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? If Jesus constituted all the Godhead, then had he forsaken himself? If so, how could this have happened? Well, Hicks replied that it was the flesh speaking to the divine spirit who had departed from the flesh at Calvary. Brother Woods promptly showed that Hicks' doctrine necessitated that only a man, nothing more, died on Execution Hill that day. With that sort of understanding on the Pentecostal part, Jesus did not differ from any other martyr dying for cause. In reality, there's but little difference in what Hicks taught in the debate than what Serenthius, the heretic, and his infamous followers taught in John's day. That deity came on Jesus at his baptism and vacated him at Calvary. That was what the uh, Gnostics, Serenthian Gnostics, in John's day taught, and that's what one this Pentecostalism teaches. They teach the doctrine of Gnosticism from the first century. Hicks did not advocate, of course, the first prong of that damnable error, but surely did the second prong. Both Serenthius and Hicks robbed Jesus of all deity when he breathed his final breath on that old rugged cross. That's nothing but slander and blasphemy against the second person of the Godhead. No person baptized with the Holy Spirit in New Testament times as per the scripture record ever slandered the Savior in such a blasphemous fashion. The Father 
allowed him to tread the winepress alone since he was the sin bearer for the race and the Almighty is of too pure an eye to behold with approval any sin or wickedness. But Jesus was still divine as the Son of God in all of his stay on Calvary. The fatal error that the Holy Spirit is the same person as Jesus Christ eliminates the propitiation through his faith or through faith in his blood to declare the right, his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, Romans 3, 25. The propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation in Romans 3, 25 <clears throat> is the same word that is translated mercy seat in Hebrews 9, 25. Here is the significance of that, and there is a significance. The significance of that term involves blood, propitiation and mercy seat. Same thing, propitiation is our mercy seat. <clears throat> Jesus is our propitiation. He is our mercy seat. Under the old law, the mercy seat stood in the holy of holies, which represented heaven. And once a year on the day of atonement, the high priest entered the Holy of Holies with blood to sprinkle on the mercy seat to atone for the sins of Israel. He only did that once a year, and he could only enter that one day a year on the Day of Atonement, and he did it for the sins of Israel. And it was at that mercy seat where God received that blood and accepted it for the atonement of Israel's sins. And it is in Jesus Christ, our propitiation, our mercy seat, where God receives, uh, uh, where he receives the blood of Christ, his own son, for not only atoning for our sins for a year, but for remitting our sins forever. Forever. One that's Pentecostalism denies that Jesus Christ is our mercy seat, that he entered heaven with his own blood. It preaches a bloodless religion devoid of any power to save. Three persons died at Calvary on that day. Jesus, or Luke wrote, there were two others, malefactors, crucified on either side of him. <coughs> it was but a if it was but a mere man who was crucified on that central cross, as Pentecostal doctrine teaches, the death of Christ had no more significance than the death of those thieves on either side of him. One of those, <clears throat> one of those men died to sin. He asked Jesus to remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So far as we know, the other one died in sin. We don't have any other record. In John 19, 32, But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who, who hung suspended between heaven and earth and between those two thieves on Calvary that day, died for sin. For our sin. For mine. To cover my sin and to cover yours. Several groups in the world who teach error on the nature of the Godhead, oneness Pentecostals included. Those who teach that are not worshiping the same God the scriptures depict. <clears throat> They're worshiping a false God, and ignorant worship needs to be corrected. Regardless of who embraces it and teaches the doctrine that the Holy Spirit is the same person as Jesus Christ, it is false doctrine. It is fatal false doctrine which implies other fatal errors and any doctrine which implies another false doctrine is itself false. And that error will cause eternal loss for anyone who believes and or practices it. Did I give you some time? Okay, give that
Well, we started off this morning with a good lesson, Brother Oxendine, and we've heard another one from Brother Brewer. These are subjects that many times by the ordinary members, and I'm afraid even some preachers, when I say ordinary, I mean the normal member of the church, very rarely studies. We appreciate the good way it was presented in Brother Brewer and the excellent way that it's laid out. He reminded me of Brother G.K. Wallace in the debate with Vaughn. Brother Wallace told me later on, he said, if I could ever get those fellows responding to me, and if you noticed his debates, he would always turn over and talk to them and ask them questions. He said that sometimes they wouldn't answer, but he said, if I could ever get them answered, I had them. <laughs> That's the way he did it. And uh, he said that Vaughn was making fun of him. Anybody who read the debate knows this because he was referring to the Trinity. And as was well pointed out, Brother Brewer, the word itself, Trinity, that is not found in the scriptures. So this is one of the times when uh, he got Vaughn to talking to him from his table when Brother Wallace was up speaking. So he asked Vaughn, would he turn to Ephesians 4? And he asked him uh, how many fathers are mentioned there? There's one. How many sons? One. He said, uh, how many Holy Spirits? One. He said, can you add one plus one plus one? What do you come up with? And he said, three. And I can just see Brother Wallace doing it because this is what he did. And he said, and that means Trinity. <laughs> now, that's debating, folks. Sometimes we forget that, especially Pentecostals, sometimes we forget that it's not enough just to refute the actual arguments they make or the doctrine they teach. But you've got to meet the man. Because so many people put so much stock in the man more than they do his reasoning or handling of the scriptures. So they both, most, um, they both must be met. In the matter of Hicks, you might not know this, uh, one thing that came in that too is when you start talking about the day Jesus was baptized and you have the Holy Spirit descending as a dove, then these folks ridicule. They, they sound a whole lot like so-called debating in the presidential debates. There's really no argumentation made. It's just ridicule and slander and slap and not and whatever. And a lot of people think, well, that's it. That's, that's my man right there. So he was saying when he brought up three there on the day of Jesus' baptism, and he got up and started saying, yeah, every time we get out of this, they start putting feathers on the, on the Son of God, feathers on the Holy Spirit. And um, no argument made, nothing, just making light of what the Scripture, really that's what he's doing, making light of what the Scripture said. Brother Woods told me that that was the first time in all the debates he had where the brother, brethren at Kennett called him aside after about midway of the debate and rebuked him for treating those fellows so badly. Now, mind you, that's 1974, I believe, five. And I was with Brother Woods not long after that. And I thought, 1975, later on, all this changing that's going on in the church, this false concept of love and all this was starting to take hold. So we have a day and age in which people just aren't interested in doctrine much on anything. It's all fluff. You start talking about the Bible with members of the church, and they might be able to spell Bible. I hate to be that way, but that's just what you're running into. People don't read their Bible. They don't think about it. They come to the services for all sorts of whatever they do. Little of it has to do with coming to a knowledge of the truth. And so it gets worse and worse to the point to where when you preach the truth, unvarnished, that was accepted and and regularly taught in churches of Christ years ago that made us what the church of Christ as the Bible defines it is, then it is so foreign to what they've been exposed to. The truth sounds hateful, mean, harsh, and terrible because they haven't been exposed to it. Amen. And that's where we are in the church, whether we like it or not. We're with the congregation. It's not that way. We better rejoice, try to keep it that way, and to make sure that when we work with people to convert them, that they understand the nature of truth and that you can't deviate from it. Well, we'll stand dismissed for another 10 minutes. Be back in here at uh, 11 for the next one. Thank you very much.